Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm Marco and uh, I'm a part of the kernel dynamic tools team at Google where I've worked on various sanitizers over the past few years. And one of them is the kernel concurrency sanitizer, uh, which we upstreamed in 2020. And I've also worked on kernel electric fence, uh, K-fence in the Linux kernel and um, various other contributions over the years. Um, so let's get started. So I think um, just to give you an idea of what we'll be talking about, um, first I'll introduce uh, background uh, on data races and to give you an idea of what we actually mean by data races, I will also introduce um, the notion of memory consistency model, uh, in particular the Linux kernel memory consistency model. And then I'll introduce uh, data race detection techniques and KCSUN, and then also discuss a few ways how you can uh, detect concurrency bugs beyond data races. So what is the problem? Um, the problem here really is that thinking about multiple threads of execution is uh, notoriously diff difficult. And there's usually this tension between performant uh, versus simpler synchronization mechanisms, and especially in the kernel. Um, where we have numerous advanced synchronization mechanisms. And we also know the kernel's job is inherently concurrent. So concurrency is everywhere. We need tool assistance um, to do our job well and write reliable code. So with that, what are data races? Data races came about because the C language and compilers evolved oblivious to concurrency. And there are numerous optimizations that compilers can apply um, to plain C language accesses that would ultimately break concurrent code. That is, there'd be a problem if the programmer requires and believed that a plain C language access actually happens as one indivisible atomic step. So the solution to this problem is to make the compiler concurrency aware. But how do we still keep um, all the nice compiler optimizations that in the common case are useful and make our code run faster. The best solution we have is to tell the compiler about accesses that will be used concurrently. And if you're interested, there are, there are lots of articles on this and one is linked here in this slide. And data races they are defined at the programming language level. So in the subspecification of the language called the memory consistency model. And since C11, uh, C and compilers are no longer oblivious to concurrency, they introduced the memory model along with atomics and so on. In C11's world, data races cause undefined behavior, simply because it's too difficult to enumerate all possible compiler and architecture combinations and how various optimizations might behave. So it's really an impossible task to give well-defined meaning to data races, but uh, that's not the Linux kernel's model exactly. So the Linux kernel has its own memory model, the Linux kernel memory consistency model. And for various re reasons, um, but in short, it's not straightforward to match the kernel's needs with what C11 would have us do. So what are data races? So I will go into more detail later but at the very basic level, um, a data race occurs if we have concurrent conflicting accesses. That is, they conflict if they access the same location and at least one is a write. And at least one is a plain access, so a plain C language access, not specially marked for synchronization. So data race free code has several benefits. Um, it is well defined, means you have kind of you avoid having to reason about compiler and the architecture and avoid having to reason, so is this data race benign? What might the compiler do here? What might the architecture do here? Uh, depending on how the compiler lowers it to assembly. So this is not uh, where we want to be. And ultimately we will have fewer bugs. Data races can also indicate higher level race condition bugs. For example, failing to synchronize accesses using locks. And ultimately we want to prevent bugs. So Data races are very good signals to us to uh, investigate a piece of code and thereby avoid countless hours debugging 
uh, various tricky race conditions. So I want to introduce a motivating example, and that is what the compiler might do and that will break concurrent code. So there's a common compiler optimization that would um, perform load fusing. So here we have a function which performs two accesses guarded. And then first, um, each if statement will load x and then perform an access. And again, in the unoptimized code, it will load uh, x and then do another access. And a common compiler optimization here is to simply perform the load to x once. And this is called load fusing. So if we had uh, a piece of code that wanted to do, say, waiting on a particular variable um, to become um, non-zero. So we would essentially here, we spin in a loop and keep reading stop, at least in the unoptimized version. That's what we think it would do. But the compilers are clever. And in the absence of telling compilers about concurrency, are free to optimize this piece of code into the code on the right side where there's a single load to stop and then an infinite loop. And that's not what we want, right? So if the programmer had intended for there to be put potential concurrent right to the stop variable, then this will break. And in the Linux kernel uh, here, for example, we would use write once to concurrently write to the stop to the variable um, reference to by stop. And in this case, it will break. The solution to this in the Linux kernel is to use marked accesses uh, such as a read once. And I will go into more detail later. And again, later races can be symptoms of higher level logic issues. For example, one of the first issues here, for example, in the FAT uh, subsystem in the Linux kernel um, that was found with KCSUN. So if we are looking at this piece of code um, at the particular accesses that KCSUN pointed out to us, so these concurrent write and read, uh, we would never guess what the fix might be, right? So the, the fix here is only obvious perhaps to a maintainer who deeply understands the code. And this data rate was merely a symptom of the higher level issue. So before I proceed, so to explain more about data race detection, I want to explain what is a memory consistency model and in particular, the Linux kernel memory consistency model. So a memory consistency model ultimately um, is a specification about how loads and stores are being observed in the presence of concurrency. So the simple answer we want to, uh, the simple question we want to answer is what value does the read access observe? And to write correct, correct concurrent code, ultimately the programmer needs to understand the semantics of the system they are programming. And the memory consistency model specifies precisely the ordering guarantees of memory operations with which programmers can reason about their parallel programs. And memory consistency models exist at different levels in our stack. So at the hardware level, um, some of you may be familiar with um, what the x86 memory model is about, for example, x86 TSO or ARM uh, and different variants of ARM are out there as well. And PowerPC and Alpha are just examples of architecture level, hardware level memory consistency models. So this is the system centric model that um, we're talking about. But it is important to note that when writing um, portable software, we should not be thinking in terms of the system-centric model, but rather the programmer-centric model. And this is, uh, at the programming language, we have our own memory models. And since C11 and C++11, um, we have uh, memory models in uh, C++ and C. And C. Uh, unfortunately, not used by the Linux kernel. And also, Java has its own memory model, for example. And various other languages um, are also beginning to introduce more rigorous memory models. 
So language level memory models ultimately are about telling the compiler um, where to expect concurrent code so that the compiler can rein in some of those optimizations that will break concurrent code, right? So we have to distinguish between marked accesses or often usually they're, um, these accesses are atomic. For example, in C and C++ 11, we have um, std atomic in C++, for example. Um, so these are special accesses that will tell the compiler to emit a particular atomic access and not to um, perform other optimizations around that location. For example, ordering operations in a particular way uh, to avoid breaking concurrency. And then we have our normal plain C language accesses, uh, which the compiler is free to optimize in all kinds of ways. And these marked accesses pr provide um, various ordering guarantees uh, and are also there, the building blocks for uh, higher level synchronization. So they're really the lowest level um, primitives that we have to know about to write concurrent code. And the compiler is not allowed to transform code in ways that would weaken the memory model. And this is an important point. Uh, and that was before um, C11 and C++11, this has been an issue. And it has, of course, also been an issue for the Linux kernel. And there's a trade-off uh, to be made uh, between ultimately more performant uh, memory models and simpler memory models. And the strictest and simplest memory model is called sequential consistency. Um, but it doesn't allow for as many optimization um, optimizations and optimization opportunities in the compiler as well as in the uh, CPUs. Um, so a weaker memory model allows for uh, greater opportunities for speculation, which usually translates into greater performance. And here I have this figure, um, which I've created many, many years ago, uh, and it lists various memory models um, at the bottom of the figure, you see the system-centric models uh, that you'll find in CPUs and even GPUs. Uh, and at the top are the programmer-centric memory models um, that we find in our programming languages. And here um, I've placed the LKMM deliberately in between, or rather on this axis of uh, PowerPC ARM, uh, which is weaker uh, considered weaker than the C11 and C++11 memory models. And it also makes it a more complicated memory model, um, but we'll get to this in a few slides. So the Linux kernel memory consistency model, or in short, LKMM, um, resulted uh, out of, I guess, many years of experience, uh, the Linux kernel trying to target a uh, vast set of um, architectures and producing as efficient code as possible. And the Linux kernel's requirements um, changed over the years and as it evolved, um, ultimately resulted in a non-standard uh, memory consistency model for better or worse. Um, but it means that the Linux kernel is uh, in full control over the ordering rules and the precise rules uh, and also allows for greater optimizations in some cases. But it has evolved and changed as well over the years. So the memory model that the Linux kernel used from 10 years ago is no longer the model that it uses today. Um, there is a formal memory model as well, if you're interested, um, that people have tried to uh, formalize the Linux kernel's memory model. And that has greatly helped also in uh, pinpointing uh, various rules of uh, the Linux kernel's memory models and, and refining them as well. Um, but real code currently uses um, slightly different, um, still slightly different rules. And sometimes these rules are also more relaxed. Um, so there is an informal documentation. Uh, you may have heard of memory bearers.txt. Um, and unfortunately, this documentation is also not complete either. So uh, in there, it even says this document is not a specification, 
it is intentionally for the sake of brevity and an un unintentionally due to being human incomplete. And if you're also interested in more discussion on this topic, there's a very good paper from 2018 uh, that you can look up. So the basic marked accesses uh, of the Linux kernel memory model and their rules are listed in this table. So the most basic one is read once. And the result here is simply it returns the value of X. Uh, it orders later dependent reads and marked writes. Uh, write once is simply a write of uh, Y to X and it orders nothing. Uh, we have SMP load acquire, which returns uh, the value of X in this case, and it orders later reads and writes. Uh, we have SMP store release. It's a write of Y to location of X, and it orders earlier reads and writes. Uh, and then there is this uh, also marked operation, RCUD reference, which is similar to read once, but should be used in RCU context, um, which returns usually a pointer um, of X and it orders later dependent reads and mark writes. Uh, and then SMP MB, which has no result. It's a simple barrier, which orders earlier and later reads and writes. SMP RMB, also no result, and it orders earlier and later reads. SMP WMB, the result is again nothing, and it orders earlier and later writes. And as I just mentioned as well, some of these operations order dependent um, accesses. So read ones in RCUD reference here are special, and this is one but important aspect of the Linux kernel memory model where it differs from other language level memory models, in particular. C++ and C, um, where the Linux kernel really wants uh, dependency ordering. In other memory models, you may have heard of consume ordering, uh, which has also caused other problems um, due to being very difficult to implement. It's not actually implemented, um, but the Linux kernel still wants dependency ordering and does its best to implement or guarantee dependency ordering. So read once and RCD dereference orders later address data and control dependent mark writes um, or address dependent reads. Uh, as an example, so here we have a read once which loads a pointer foo, for example, and x, the x then the variable x is again, it's a pointer and then it dereferences that again with the read ones. And in this case, this is called an address dependency and uh, the LKMM tries to guarantee ordering of these two accesses. Similar for data dependencies um, and also control dependencies, but control dependencies only with later writes. So here we have a uh, read once and that loads some variable into X and then the, this X is used in a condition. Uh, and then if the condition is true, uh, performs a write once. And this read once to write once are supposed to be ordered through a control dependency. And here is an example as well that is not ordered through control dependencies uh, where we have a read once and then the value that was loaded into X if that is used in a condition, uh, the read ones that is executed if the condition is true would not be ordered. And uh, a warning here, this is really one of the most tricky aspects of the Linux kernel memory model and is likely to change in future because compilers um, can still break dependencies. And there is even uh, from last year, Linux Plumas conference, it was shown that this is happening in the wild, um, unfortunately, um, so we are, there are people working on solving this and it is, there's a, a chance that this aspect of the kernel memory model may change in future as well. There are many more marked accesses. 
um, for example, all atomic T accessors. So the Linux kernel has this uh, container called atomic T, which uh, is which provides together with various accessors, um, atomic accesses, for example, atomic increment, uh, decrement, uh, compare and exchange, and so on. And various other atomic read modify writes uh, the kernel has, they're also marked accesses uh, and atomic bit ops uh, found in the kernel as well. So now we get to the part where I can tell you more about uh, what data races are in the Linux kernel memory models world. So data races occur if we have, and as I earlier mentioned as well, um, current conflicting accesses, they conflict if they access the same location and at least one is a write, and at least one is a plain unmarked access. So here we have uh, several examples. So the first one, um, this is obviously a data race. There's a, um, a read of X and then also a concurrent write. This would be a data race. Uh, in the second example as well, we have uh, a write once. Um, although this is a marked operation, the read is unmarked. So therefore this is a data race. Um, here, the third example, we have a read once, it's a marked operation, but an unmarked uh, write, which is also would be a data race. Um, there are still a lot of, um, and here the third example I want to point out. So even though the write is unmarked, there is still a lot of um, concurrent code in the Linux kernel where the writes may not be marked. So this is one thing that also with the help of case CSUN, we're trying to improve um, but there are still some, some cases also perhaps due to um, legacy uh, preferences of um, various maintainers in, the, in these particular subsystems that not all writes are marked. So this is just a caveat I want to point out. Um, the fourth example also, this is a data race. We have a marked read, but uh, a, an unmarked read modify write operation. So just an increment of X, and this is a data race as well. And then also here, we have two unmarked writes. Um, this would also be a data race. And then the last two examples are not data races um, because all the operations uh, involved here uh, are marked. So in the first case here, we have a read once and a write once. Those both are marked accesses. Therefore, this is not a data race. Uh, the last example here, we have two write once, um, both accesses are a mark, therefore not a data race. So intentional data races also still exist in the Linux kernel. So the Linux kernel says that data races do not result in undefined behavior of the whole kernel, uh, but rather is locally undefined. Um, so where code can still operate correctly, even with potentially random data, um, data races are tolerated. So for example, statistics counting is a case is one example where you may still find in the Linux kernel, a lot of um, intentional data races. And uh, through uh, upstreaming of KCSEN, we also uh, introduced this notion of explicitly marking such cases with a data race expression. So this is just simply data underscore race. And uh, it is useful to, to document the intent that there is an intentional data race. It's not a bug. And it also helps tooling such as KCSUN to understand they are intentional. And there's a very helpful document in the Linux kernel uh, called accessmarking.txt, which has a lot of uh, these this guidance. And I think here I want to briefly pause maybe for some questions. Uh, Marco, there is a question in the Q&A box. Would you like me to read that to you or can, do you, can you see can, it on your screen? Right, I can, I think I can see that. Um, oh, right, okay, so there's a question. Um, can you throw light on exactly um, what exactly memory ordering is uh, with a few examples? Right, this is a good question. Um, so memory ordering, and let me just go back to perhaps the dependency ordering example. 
even though it is not restricted to dependency ordering in any way. Um, what usually happens is so if you're writing concurrent code, uh, you want accesses to appear in a certain order with respect to other concurrent uh, observers of that data that you're writing, for example. So if we are um, here, for example, we have, we have um, read ones, two read ones, which are ordered. And one example here would be that the address pointed to by foo, so that location um, is written by some other thread. And the other thread is using perhaps a release operation. So here I mentioned um, release. So what does SMP store release do? It orders all earlier reads and writes. Then what might happen is that that other thread before doing this SMP store release, it was performing updates to some data, writing a lot of other data. And then finally, it wants to publish this data by updating a pointer in this first example here, um, where we call out this address dependency, for example, it will publish that with a pointer writing that to, like in this, in the, in this example, foo, um, where the reader of this data wants to observe the changes that happened before. So essentially before they were published, it wants to observe all of these changes. What can happen in weekly ordered architectures and also through compiler optimizations is that without telling um, the CPU or the compiler that you want to order earlier writes, the CPU or the compiler is free to reorder operations around um, other writes. And if, for example, you're not using an SMP store release to publish uh, data updates, CPU or compiler can reorder um, updates after that, which would mean that another concurrent reader later is not guaranteed to see the updates that happened before you were telling it to get all the new data, right? Does that roughly answer the question? I guess we'll um, call it answered. Um, okay. There's another, uh, uh, you could, uh, please come back if uh, you have a follow-up question. Um, there is another question about um, in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. If you can see the chat, I posted I it for everybody. Yes, I see that. So is, I, I will just read it. Um, the Rust programming language seems to address part of the memory management problems that you describe here. Wouldn't it be useful to use it in the Linux kernel in a more deep level? So um, at this very, very low level, um, every language has a memory model. Even Rust uh, has a memory consistency model. And in fact, uh, Rust is adopting, uh, as far as I'm aware, it is adopting a um, slightly simplified version of the C++11 memory model. So this is not about locking per se. A memory model gives you the rules which with, with which you can implement locks and other synchronization primitives. And Rust, of course, also has to implement these primitives somewhere. And the memory consistency model will give you the rules to implement higher level synchronization primitives. And of course, there are also cases where someone might do want to do a lock-free programming in Rust. In this case, you also uh, want to know the rules with which you can reason about your concurrent code. Of course, I'm, as I, I'm guessing in those cases, it might be common to uh, have to drop to unsafe Rust. Um, but in uh, safe Rust, as far as I'm aware, right, you're also using synchronization primitives like spin locks or mutexes. And the rules with which they, they are implemented follow the memory consistency model. I hope that so what, answers the question. So what you're saying is there is no magic magic wand. Um, no. And right. So you have to do the hard work of uh, implementing, com coming up with a memory model, adopting it, and implementing it. Uh, Correct. In, right. And um, 
every language, and I also want to stress this, right? Every programming language where you have concurrency has a memory model. Sometimes it is something that you get, you're exposed to more than in other programming languages. Uh, some languages' memory models are simpler than others. Um, but fundamentally, there, if there is concurrency, there's a memory model, either informal or formal or something in between. Um, but without a memory model, the architecture, the compilers, and the programmers could never agree, right? So this is uh, why memory models are so important. And Rust definitely has a memory model where you're, you're then talking about, okay, the language, and then the compiler implements that. It lowers it in a way that is uh, compatible with the architecture, being careful that the guarantees made at the language level are still preserved at this system-centric level that I hear this figure, for example, right? So if you're lowering from a language it's like C++ or C to an architecture that implements TSO, you have certain rules how to do that. And there are also different rules how to implement the memory model correctly if you're lowering to, for example, PowerPC or ARM. And the same also is true for Rust. There is another question in the Q and A. Right. Um, so, okay. So, how do we decide when and when not to use SMP primitives? For example, uh, driver authors aren't typically use these unless going across a hardware boundary. Is there a definitive way to know when and when not to use them? Yes. So the simplest way would be um, if you have a data race, you probably should use them, right? So this is also what I'll get to later in more detail and uh, also how KCSAN can help you in particular. Um, so if you're writing concurrent code, you want to, of course, you want to understand in which order data is supposed to be um, modified and published. And then if you're writing, again, if you're not using um, locking explicitly, in some cases, this may be necessary. Um, and you're writing concurrent code, and you want to be aware of, I guess, the concurrency design of the code. And then you need to know in which order and where potentially um, concurrent updates can happen. And in, in all those cases, uh, if there is concurrency between different accesses, you most certainly want to use marked accesses um, because otherwise you would have a data race, right? So this is what the definition um, that I have here points out, right? So if you have um, concurrent conflicting accesses and they conflict, if they access the same location, and at least one is a right. So at that point, if you're not using a marked access, you're going to have, if you're not using marked accesses, you will have a data race and you'll run into all the issues with data races. Uh, and that's a very clear signal that probably if you should rethink the concurrency design, if you have data races in critical concurrency algorithms. I hope that answers the question. So if there are no more questions, I think uh, we can proceed. Yes, go ahead. Okay. All right, so data race detection in the Linux kernel. So first I want to point out um, dynamic analysis, because this is the, the, the techniques that we're going to use to detect data races are all dynamic analysis. Um, so dynamic analysis is about detecting certain bug classes or issues with your code dynamically at runtime. And the way this works is that you take a bunch of source files or even binary files, you modify them in some way, by inserting checks. And then uh, the final executable will have additional runtime checks in them. That when you're executing the code, there are um, 
all these checks basically are performed as you're executing code. And if uh, there is a state change in that the dynamic analysis runtime observes that is uh, invalid or erroneous in some way, it would then generate a report. And uh, there is also there's a previous uh, webinar from 2021, which actually talks about dynamic analysis in general in more detail from my colleague, uh, Dimitri. So in the Linux kernel, there have been um, various past attempts uh, at data race detection. And the most notable one is um, the kernel thread sanitizer. And I also want to point this out because if uh, you're perhaps familiar with data race detection in user space, uh, you may have used uh, thread sanitizer. So thread sanitizer is uh, one of the most widely used data race detectors for user space. And of course, uh, one of the first things that um, was tried is to implement the same algorithm in the Linux kernel. Um, KTSAN in this case, um, or also Thread Sanitizer is a compiler instrumentation based. So it uses compiler instrumentation um, to insert these checks um, with this flag F sanitized thread. And uh, the algorithm um, is based on uh, detecting happens before relations between uh, concurrent operations. And this can be quite costly to implement because it requires vector clocks, which are actually very um, rather space intensive uh, data structures. Uh, the pros of this approach was that it has fewer false negatives. Um, it's very precise and it detects memory ordering issues quite well so missing memory barriers right like the if you're if you're instead of using uh, smp store release you're using uh, write once for example uh, this approach would quite well detect these issues uh, the problem was that kt sound was not scalable it has huge memory overheads so this is in the gigabytes and um, false positives uh, lots of false positives unfortunately without annotating all synchronization primitives. And this was, I think, ultimately uh, what broke the camel's back, I guess, if you, uh, so to speak, um, because false positives is something that really cannot be tolerated in the Linux kernel because wasting developers' time is the last thing uh, that we want to do. And also it diminishes the, um, the um, I guess, the, the people or, or developers are investigating reports, um, any false positive will cause um, trust in the tool to degrade. And that's not what we want. And the way this worked is simply you have a normal C code and then the compiler with the F-sanitized thread flag added. And this is uh, GCC and Clang both support this flag. They will add these checks um, before every access and then do their checking uh, if there are data races. And this again, this depends on the algorithm. In KTSAN, it was a very different algorithm. And KCSAN, uh, again, is a very different algorithm. But the idea of inserting checks um, with the help of a compiler is shared. There was yet another approach, various other approaches um, that were not based on compiler instrumentation. So there was uh, this tool called RaceHound, um, which is based on the data collider approach. And the basic idea here was simply, um, you set a hardware watch point um, on some access, you wait for a bit, and then if the breakpoint triggered while you were waiting, um, then there's a race, right? So current access, the only way the, the, the um, watch point could trigger if you're waiting and not doing anything else in the thread where the access is supposed to happen, um, then there must have been a concurrent access. So, And also, um, if while you're waiting and twiddling your thumb, right, if you're seeing that there is a concurrent access that changed the value of the location that uh, you're watching, then you also can infer that there was a race. But th these ideas never made it into the mainline Linux curve. And the question is why? And I think when we looked at this problem uh, again back, like this was four years ago now, we looked at this problem and we were wondering what can we do, right? So what are the requirements for the Linux kernel? And I think 
uh, of course, one of the uh, most important criteria here is runtime performance. We want to have something that is performant. I think all these approaches, uh, including KTSAN, they were performant or essentially could be optimized to the point where they are performant enough. Um, also low memory overhead here, KTSAN unfortunately showed us that um, the to optimize it to a point where it would be acceptable even for um, smaller systems, it was too difficult. And so, uh, and also, the preference of uh, false negatives over um, false positives. And as I mentioned, right, so with every false positive that would be sent to a kernel developer, the trust in the tool is diminished. And this really is one of the biggest problems as well um, that with KTSAM because it required keeping up with changes, upstream changes um, to synchronization primitives to make it have no false positives. And this was really as like just say, even if there's momentarily be between releases, there might be some false positives as they're being fixed in the tool themselves. I think that we determined to be um, unacceptable. Uh, and this also then leads to maintenance, right? It's uh, supposed to be unintrusive to the rest of the kernel. And again, with uh, KTSAN, this was a big problem. Um, and here we want to also have scalable memory access instrumentation. So with the help of the a uh, compiler, this can be made scalable. The compiler just selects every access and it automatically scales to the whole code base. And also the, um, the analysis should be language level access aware. So it should be compatible with the Linux kernel memory model. And here again, this watch point based approach at least to the point where um, these Racehound and Data Collider that they considered for the Linux kernel, it was too difficult, or at least it's, um, it wasn't considered. With KTSAN, again, this is um, through the various synchronization rules and, and so on, because the compiler is involved, this, can, uh, this is supported in this uh, design. And I want to show you KCSAN, which will satisfy all of these criteria and essentially was a rethink of how to do data race detection, scalable data race detection in the Linux kernel uh, that satisfies all of these requirements. So now I'm going to introduce finally KCSAN, uh, the Linux kernel concurrency sanitizer. So KCSAN is compiler instrumentation based. Um, it's a dynamic data race detector, so dynamic analysis based, and it reuses um, Clang and GCC's thread sanitizer instrumentation, but the runtime is completely different. So by default, it just detects data races as I've defined them earlier. And with special assertions that I will also discuss, it can help you find even more bugs beyond data races. And it was introduced in the Linux kernel 5.8. And since then, several improvements have been made and the most notable one that I want to point out here is uh, that with kernel 5.17, uh, KCSAN can even detect uh, some data races due to missing memory barriers. And this was something that um, due to the algorithm of KCSAN, initially we thought that um, we couldn't uh, detect missing memory barriers, but KCSAN can detect a subset of missing memory barriers. And here the, we're combining the best of, I guess, the previous approaches that I uh, discussed. So um, with KTSAN, so the thread sanitizer instrumentation, we're instrumenting the entire kernel. And then we're taking this approach of also using watch points, right? So we want to observe exactly when two accesses happen concurrently. And the way to do this is to use uh, watch points. And here KTSAN is, Essentially, it's observing that two accesses happen concurrently right when they happen, and it checks accesses, um, all, of the, all accesses that are instrumented by the compiler. Um, but one big innovation in KCSAN was that we're using this notion of soft watch points. So they're not hardware watch points. Uh, we wanted to keep KCSAN portable to lots of different architectures uh, 
uh, irrespective of hardware breakpoint support or hardware watch point support. So, and to do this, we implemented a fairly efficient um, algorithm for soft watch points. So, and here again, the idea is uh, we set a soft watch point. Um, if an access happens uh, that was instrumented by the compiler, we enter the KC Sun runtime, set a watch point, stall briefly. And if the watch point um, fires or it already exists, we know there's a race. If the value changed as well, so bef like before the access is performed by the current thread, uh, we check the value. If it changed after this brief delay, the stalling uh, that Casey Sun does, then we also infer there's a race. And it stalls accesses with random delays um, to increase the chance to observe uh, a race. Um, the various, like the default parameters you can see here, but you can also change them at runtime or uh, with a kernel config. Um, and one other thing with KC Sun is to keep the system performant, it uses a sampling strategy. So every access is checked for there being uh, a watch point setup, but it samples accesses to set watch points on. So because of watch point itself, we stall for a few microseconds. Doing this on every access would be one wasteful and also uh, would slow down the kernel too much. And by default, it does this for every 2000 accesses. And, but this can also be configured. So for example, if you want to have a more aggressive case CSUN, then you could do this with a simple config change or even at runtime uh, by changing the, the kernel parameters in sysfs. Uh, the caveat here is that this means that there's a slightly lower probability to detect very rare races, but we found this is offset by very, very good stress tests um, or just fuzzers like syscaller. And when we first experimented with KCSAN, we found hundreds of race data races immediately. So Obviously, uh, that meant the approach works very well if we pair it with a good fuzzer. So now how to use KCSUN. Um, KCSUN these days is supported on various architectures, such as x86, um, only 64-bit x86, ARM64, S390, MIPS, PowerPC, um, Extensor, and perhaps even more in future. Um, Compiler requirements, so you require at least uh, CLAN 11 or later, um, or GCC 11 or later. And you can build your kernel with simply setting config KC sun equals yes. I will show you in a second also how to get uh, to the same config uh, with the help of menu config. And uh, I want to stress that KC sun is only for debugging and testing kernels. So it's not recommended to enable in production kernels because there is a about uh, more than 5x slowdown. Um, but this also depends on, I guess, ex your exact system configuration, how many um, CPUs you have, and so on. Uh, but generally, you can expect roughly 5x slowdown. These days, also, um, if you're trying to use KCSAN to debug your own code, I strongly recommend using KCSAN strict mode, which follows the strict kernel memory model rules. Um, beware that as of uh, the latest kernel, enabling this mode may still produce uh, lots of data races, which are uh, not yet addressed or fixed. Um, most of them are considered relatively benign, um, but to fix them properly, it will take time. And I'm expecting that um, it may still take a few years um, for all data races to be completely um, resolved in the kernel. And if you enable KC Sun strict mode, it also includes weak memory model modeling. So detecting um, a subset of missing memory barriers. For example, if you're using a write once um, wrongly and you should have used an SMP store release instead. Um, so KC Sun can help you detect um, issues like this as well, since kernel 5.17. And to enable KCSAM, you go to, um, in with menu config, you go to the kernel hacking section in generic kernel debugging instruments, and then KCSAM. And there you can just configure KCSAM. Usually the defaults are 
good enough for everyone or for, for most people. Um, uh, one thing that you have to explicitly enable, which is not enabled in the default config, is this strict data race checking. And this has uh, several reasons is that there are still, um, of course, the, the um, a lot of code or subsystems uh, that don't receive as much maintenance as others still have a lot of data races. And we just wanted to make sure that um, the data races that Casey Sam points out are in terms of severity, more on the more severe end of the spectrum. And we added some heuristics um, to try and filter uh, data races that are more on the severe end of the spectrum. Nevertheless, if you're writing new code or you're trying to use KCSUN on your own code uh, specifically, I highly recommend using the strict data race checking mode. And if you boot the kernel with KCSUN, you will usually see a message like KCSUN enabled early, just to double check uh, that KCSUN is actually enabled. And if you are running with KCSUN enabled, you will see reports such as this. Um, so here you usually, and you, you have a title which shows two functions that raced. Um, it has access information about these, the two racing accesses. It shows the operation, uh, which address, and which size, um, the access was and then also the context and on which CPU. Um, and then it shows a call trace. Um, so basically the, the, the current um, stack trace that leads up to that particular address. And if you, for example, put this stack trace through um, address to line, then it should also tell you exactly which um, line in the source code the access is. Uh, optionally, KCSEN can also show you locked up info if you've compiled the kernel with uh, proof locking on and KCSEN verbose mode is also enabled. It will also show um, locked up info. This can be helpful to also debug issues uh, more easily. Um, and then it also it shows both accesses and at the bottom it gives you a brief summary of your system as well. And the severity of data races is something uh, that's probably one of the most tricky topics or, um, and to, to really understand the severity of a data race, this is something that also we're still uh, trying to understand and even are trying to work on techniques to perhaps automatically classify severity of a data race. But usually it is, if you're finding a data race, uh, you will start debugging and there are several types of concurrency bugs that a data race uh, may point out. And uh, in the first case, so in the worst case, it is a race condition bug where the resulting error manifests as a data race um, followed by eventual system failure, right? So for example, the kernel panicking as a result of a race condition bug that led to a data race where the data race is only a symptom of this uh, of the race condition bug. Um, so these are the trickiest to debug and fix as well. So because simply marking the accesses uh, with the primitives that I've shown you earlier does not fix the problem. And the fix usually requires more invasive changes to program logic. Um, so for example, adding missing locking or perhaps even rewriting completely um, parts, parts of the logic um, of uh, the subsystem that you're dealing with, right? So, and in the second case, it's um, a data race may point out uh, that a miscompilation from the compiler. So if the compiler optimizes the code in a certain way, it uh, will result in, uh, in this case, a miscompilation um, with respect to concurrency. And that will introduce bugs that can lead to system failure. So in this case also, if um, the compiler performs optimizations in certain ways, um, the fact that there is a data race um, would then potentially also lead to uh, the system crashing and or the kernel pa panicking, right? And the fix here would be to uh, use the appropriate marking uh, marked accesses. So as I pointed out earlier, appropriate marked atomic accesses. Uh, and fixing these 
uh, types of concurrency bugs usually doesn't it doesn't require fundamental changes in program logic. Um, and then the third uh, class of um, issue is where a data race uh, may point out that a compiler optimization or essentially a, a compilation, miscompilation in a way that programmer hadn't uh, intended for will introduce tolerated inaccuracies. Right? So in this case, we might speak of benign data races, but these miscompilations won't actually lead to catastrophic system failure. They won't crash the kernel. And typically this would be something like approximate diagnostics, um, for example, statistics counting, where if you're missing, uh, say one increment of a statistics counter, it is not catastrophic. It may only result in you perhaps re reading uh, an inaccurate uh, statistic somewhere. And in those cases, if you determine then that you actually can tolerate um, compilations or optimizations, compiler optimizations that will result in these uh, inaccuracies, uh, you can actually just mark uh, the data race or the, the accesses that are involved in the data race with the data race macro, uh, which will tell KCS then to never tell you about the data race that you uh, that it pointed out ever again. And this is also helpful then uh, to actually to, to point out intent that uh, it's not a bug and someone else that will find the same data race will not um, wonder if it is a bug. But it is very important um, that if you're running KCSUN, you're finding data races uh, to not blindly mark accesses in various ways. Say, for example, by just blindly sprinkling read ones or write ones everywhere, which would then result in hiding uh, bugs of type A. And we want to avoid this. And this is some also the reason why it is taking so long uh, since the introduction of case CSUN uh, in the Linux kernel, um, that we're still having data races and it is taking long to actually uh, slowly, slowly work on removing all the data races in the kernel, simply because there aren't enough people or the people who have the knowledge of subsistence where there are data races don't have the time to investigate um, the severity of a data race. And I think at this point, we also can take questions. There is a question in the Q&A box and I posted a, put a question in the chat as well, Marco. Yes. Um, okay. I, uh, Kaiwan says, FYI, I found that setting config KC sun assume plain writes atomic. Yes, two can help. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure in which context, uh, but generally the, this probably relates to the noisiness. Uh, and yes, this is one of the things that uh, in a lot of subsystems, plain writes, uh, racing plain writes with other say marked breeds are not considered um, data races and it is simply optional to mark them in some cases, but we have added this heuristic um, or this rule to KCSAN um, to consider plain writes uh, that are aligned and up to machine word size to consider them atomic uh, because on with at least most compilers that we're aware of, they will simply emit uh, for the architectures that were, I guess, that are relevant, an atomic um, store. But this is not guaranteed and it may change in future. And generally that's why I recommend um, if you're working on your own concurrent code, I recommend using KCS and strict mode, which will turn off all of these heuristics and rules. Um, I hope that uh, answers this point. Yes, correct. It really is yes. reasoning about data races and which compilers generate the code you want is a really, really difficult undertaking. So that's why in general, we do just recommend to uh, get rid of all data races 
And if you're particularly worried, use strict mode, get rid of all data races, and you don't have to reason about how the compiler might compile your code. Okay, uh, next. Look at chat. Right, so there's one question. Uh, does 5x slowdown uh, make it harder to debug race conditions and timing related issues? Um, actually, with KCSAN, it makes it easier to sometimes hit certain race conditions um, because KCSAN inserts uh, these delays. So that actually results in uh, potentially like different schedules or perturbations in the schedules between different uh, threads of execution to become more likely, uh, at least that's what we found. So it introduces some randomness um, yes. that allows uh, uh, finding problems. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. And also this, the delays can be tweaked, but I think the defaults that are chosen um, are such that it actually it doesn't slow down the kernel too much. And, but it and it's also introduces some randomness. So the, the uh, chosen, like the configured delays in the kernel config are the it's the upper bound and then it chooses some random uh, random value so that way with different runs it might actually find different schedules or perturbations but we found with adding these delays or um, through i mean even if uh, with these extra instrumentation inserted sometimes different schedules or perturbations um, in the in the thread interleaving become more likely um, but of course, there may be also cases that go the other direction. So I also acknowledge that point. Okay. Thank you. There is a question, does this randomness make bug reproducing much harder? Uh, reproducing concurrency bugs uh, is very difficult, even without KCSAM. Um, with KCSAN, I don't think it is any more or less difficult. Um, what we found is, at least with uh, Syscaller, we still haven't found a good way to generate reproduces for data races. Uh, and this is simply because it, it, it depends on all kinds of factors, right? If you have different threads of execution, you have to try and hit the same interleaving of all of these threads of at least set of interleavings that make some data race uh, possible and, and that's what we're trying to reproduce and reproducing that is very difficult and this is an ongoing area of research um, i think we um, like at the moment we're not investigating reproducing uh, concurrency bugs or even data races actively but um, it is a very interesting area of research and something that we hope to uh, address in the future as well, using, for example, Sysbot. If it, Sysbot finds data races, having reproducers would be very helpful. But at the moment, it's uh, not able to do this reliably. Thank you. Looks like that's it for questions for now, Marco. Okay, so then I will proceed. Um, so, um, so far we've talked about data races and how you can detect data races and then also the severity of data races. One data races uh, like might tell you about the concurrency issue that you have in your code. But there are also, of course, concurrency bugs beyond data races concurrency bugs that do not or would not manifest as data races. And KCSAN can also help you uh, find some of these issues. So I will introduce an example um, here. So for example, we have one thread uh, where there is a spin lock and it locks the update foo lock. And, and there is a comment, careful, there should not be no other writers to shared foo. Uh, readers are okay. So in this case, what we have is a shared variable, shared foo, uh, which can only be updated um, 
by a single writer, but can have multiple concurrent readers, even while it is being updated. So here we have another thread that will do this exactly without the lock. It won't take update full lock, but it will read uh, the shared variable uh, with a read once. This is not a data race, and this is allowed according to the uh, comment. And then we have a third thread, which does exactly what we didn't want. There's a bug, there's a, a concurrent, potentially concurrent write to the shared variable and because the third thread is not taking the lock. And this is a bug. And in, 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 with the help of KCSAM, we could introduce uh, this assert called assert exclusive writer. So KCSAN has um, several macros, this family of assert exclusive uh, macros, which can help you add um, additional annotations to your code to convey the content, uh, to convey the intent um, of your concurrency design to KCSAN and then help you find um, bugs such as uh, concurrent uh, writer to the shared variable without uh, taking the, the lock. And there are several of these uh, macros um, and they're all, they are all prefixed with assert exclusive and they, they can help you uh, specify properties of concurrent code um, where bugs are not normally data races. And I want to stress that if um, there are accesses or um, say unmarked accesses where a bug would likely manifest in a data race, then I would strongly suggest to just not, I mean, not unnecessarily sprinkle these assertions into your code. But if there are, for example, uh, marked accesses in your code and a concurrent update to some of these might be a bug, using these assertions can help you with that. And in the kernel log, these um, bugs of this type, if KCSAN detects them, would be prefixed with uh, KCSAN, assert um, race in, and then the functions, and then the usual report that it shows. And the three types of, um, or rather there are five, but uh, there are two um, that will uh, I will get to uh, in a second, what, what the difference between them is. So we have assert exclusive writer, uh, which takes a variable, um, so essentially it's um, uh, similar to if you're like passing a variable directly to read once or uh, simply accessing the content of that variable, that's what you pass to a certain exclusive writer. So if you have a pointer, you would dereference um, the pointer. So an expression that returns a value. Uh, and in this case, um, a certain exclusive writer uh, will assert that there are no concurrent writers, but there can be concurrent readers. Um, the, there is a second type of this same assertion called assert exclusive writer scope, which will assert this for the entire scope of a function. So if this is put at the start of a function, so assert exclusive writer scoped at the start of a function will perform, um, will assert that there are no concurrent writers for the entire function. And then um, more strict um, assertion, assert exclusive access, so it will assert that the current thread has exclusive access to a particular um, variable location and will assert that there are no concurrent writers and no concurrent readers. And there is a different, a third uh, variant of this called assert exclusive bits, which will actually assert that there are no concurrent writers to a, to a subset of bits of a variable. And this was introduced because there was a, a case in the memory management subsystem and um, we wanted to um, mark um, or essentially tell KCSAN that updating a particular bit in a variable concurrently was actually a bug, but all other bits we didn't care about. So, but if you're interested in this, the documentation has a lot more detail on this. Um, or I can answer it later. Please add questions um, if you have. Um, to summarize, um, 
So concurrency in the Linux kernel is quite challenging. Um, and we need to use good tooling for this. And KCSAN is one of these tools. There are other tools in the Linux kernel as well that can help uh, among them, for example, Loctet. But the types of bugs that the other tools detect um, are different from KCSAN. And KCSAN really helps detect concurrency bugs at this lowest level um, and tries to help you tell them about data races and uh, so that you can avoid introducing concurrency bugs as early as possible. And my suggestion is to avoid data races altogether if you can, unless you have, for example, um, these approximate diagnostics that I mentioned earlier. But in general, um, all new concurrent code in the Linux kernel, uh, I strongly recommend using KCSAM and its strict mode to avoid uh, data races. And there's uh, a lot more documentation on KCSAN, and then also a two-part article, uh, Concurrency Bugs Should Fear the Big Bad Data Race Detector, which goes into some of the philosophies around um, why certain subsystems may choose uh, slightly different styles of preferences to um, how to mark excesses. And I think with this, um, I can take more Questions? Any other questions for Marco? So you're, uh, what, what you're saying is when you write a new code or if you have an existing code base that you have never run KCSAN, run it in strict mode to find problems and tweak the randomness if you can to, to find more problems, if you will. Um, right. So at least do that on your code base. And then um, if somebody writes a new driver, for example, we say this, right? When somebody writes a new driver, we say um, enable lock de uh, detection and then all of the lock, spin lock debugs to find all, all the places there could be problems. So KCSAN can be used to uh, just detect all of the data races and uh, such concurrency problems you might have in the new code and, and also yes. existing code. So I think, um, yes. So I think the, the, main, the main point is that I want to uh, encourage everyone to write code that is free from data races and use KCSAN strict mode as well. So the, the stricter uh, treatment of the kernel memory model rules. Um, so I think I had a slide somewhere. Ah, I may have skipped this one. Um, so on also testing best practices, right? Because you mentioned drivers, for example, and I think often it can be quite tricky actually to, um, to generate um, or to, to, to execute tests that will hit these corner cases and then perhaps data races or rarer data races. So I think this is a, a good, good strategy is to, with new code or even existing code that people want to improve is to write rigorous concurrency tests. So of course we want to, and I will go over the slide uh, briefly, is um, to design test cases to cover, of course, both expected and unexpected interleavings. And and this can be slightly tricky, right? You have to really think about how the how different threads of executions may interact, and then, um, of course, yeah, ensuring all the various tricky corner cases are considered, uh, real world cases are considered, and then stressing uh, the code with the high number of threads that simulates uh, worst case scenarios. And for drivers, I think, I mean, this this is really it's a it's a interesting exercise, I think, to design tests that will stress um, 
the code in ways that would simulate worst case um, concurrency cases. Um, and I think here it's important to also write tests that can quickly be executed uh, repeatedly so that you can just set a, a okay, how, how many times do you want to execute a particular case in a loop and then do this really, really quickly for thousands of iterations. And this will help KCSUN also, um, in, it will help improve the probability that KCSUN can detect issues. Uh, and then also fuzzing, of course. But with fuzzing, again, there's, it's not guaranteed that um, fuzzers will be able to find the, the tricky uh, corner cases where there is a weird data race or race that will then result in a crash, right? because you have to really think about how you may generate um, inputs such that the kernel will then execute different threads and produce interleavings that will result in a bad state and then cause a crash. And with KCSUN, I think um, my recommendation then is if you're writing new code, write rigorous stress tests with, it will um, execute lots of different threads and keep the concurrency of the code to be tested in mind and then enable KCSUN and hopefully uh, that will really weed out a lot of the concurrency issues. Right, that brings to mind um, the media subsystem. I had to write uh, a test script to make sure that the resource is not being touched, um, driver structure is not being touched after, uh, use after free type error, mm -hmm. kicking off um, five or six instances of the script to just stress test the driver um, device file. So yes, that's kind of what you're saying. You have to write, um, you have to think about concurrency and you have to think about what are the point vulnerabilities in your code and go at them with writing tests and then also use KCSAN and other tools to make sure that your code is solid. Okay. Yes, yeah. And KCSAN also has various knobs. And I think in the kernel, conf the kernel documentation, um, so KCSUN uh, kernel doc has also documentation on the various knobs that uh, KCSUN has to tweak the, the, the performance. And also I think actually I can, if I click on this and then I hope that you can still see uh, this window. Mm -hmm. uh, here actually in this, uh, there's one section on Ah, tuning performance, right? So this is the one um, that I wanted to mention. So I think by default, um, the default parameters that KCSUN has are very good. They, I think that's the, I would just leave it and run with the default parameters and then try and find as many bugs uh, or data races as possible with that. And then once uh, that is exhausted, I think then uh, more advanced uses of KCSUN would then consider tweaking uh, these core parameters. Uh, and in particular, the one uh, that I would tweak is skip watch parameter, uh, which is the number of um, per CPU memory operations that KCSUN skips before it sets up another watch point. Um, so it's the sampling strategy that KCSUN uses. And uh, with this one, actually, yeah, it can, you can actually do this on the, the kernel. Um, like if you're, if you're in a terminal, you can just pipe uh, a new integer into um, sys module KCSAM parameters and then skip watch, for example, after this, that would be changing the skip watch parameter. And it's nice to actually play with this and you can then see how also the kernel might uh, become slightly less responsive if, you, if, if this value is lowered or it becomes slightly more responsive if you increase it. And then uh, I think one also effective strategy, and that's also what I, um, have have done in the past is to just write a shell script that randomly changes the, the this value in the background. Although the skip watch parameter is already randomized, but I think to just keep the performance predictable in KCSUN, we've chosen to not change the value too uh, too drastically, um, randomly, but rather 
uh, leave it to the user, which can then in user space set this parameter and change it on the fly as needed. And then also that way um, perhaps improve KC Sense performance. But by default, I would at first not recommend tweaking these parameters. Thank you. Any other questions for Marco? So if you're watching the chat, thank you, Sir Floyd and Marco. You're welcome. Yeah, I hope it was useful. And yes, please let me know if there are any more questions. I can also try and um, Right, so here, um, as, I'm, I, as I talked earlier about the uh, assert exclusive macros, I think those are, again, those are fall into the more advanced uses of KCSAM, but I, I, I really would like to see more uses of the assert exclusive uh, macros in the kernel because I think they can really help uh, find more um, bugs, concurrency bugs in the kernel. Uh, and here, again, this is the, 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 the same example that I showed earlier. Um, but I think these are um, very interesting also for, um, I've used it in, I think, one, uh, one new code that I wrote, and I also use these macros. It also helps to document uh, the intent. For example, if it is not easy to express, um, let's say a certain variable shouldn't be accessed uh, concurrently. Um, if it is, again, it's a marked access, and then it helps to document this intent rather than um, writing this in documentation, right? That I, like in this example, right? Instead of writing in documentation, careful, there should be no other writers using these uh, macros. Thank you very much. This has been a very useful session. Uh, it'll be, it, um, it'll help a lot of people, new developers, especially coming in and going, what do we do? How do we figure things out? And even uh, people that are, have been doing this work for a long time, they want to find out what kind of uh, concurrency problems are lurking in their code. So this is very um, helpful. Great, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, I think if there are, uh, no further questions, then I think it may also be time to hand it uh, back to you. Thank you, and also... Marco. And... Perfect. Thank you, Marco and Shua, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you are able to join us for future webinar session or future mentorship session. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.